So yeah, today we are going to talk about a journey that I had uh, in using uh, SILADB. Um, just to start, a bit about myself, if he wants to, to move. Yep, OK. Better. So you can find me about uh, everywhere as uh, Ultrabug. I'm a Gen2 Linux developer and CTO at Numberly. Uh, Numberly helps uh, um, brands and our customers to, to, to leverage the value of their data in the digital space. Um, so we use a lot of, uh, of open source uh, and we contribute back uh, a lot in all the tools that, uh, that we use and, uh, and, and love. Um, so my open source engagement uh, is mainly related to, uh, to, to being a gentle Linux developer and uh, all the possibilities that it gives you, uh, apart from the commit uh, possibility on portage. But uh, usually it's a, it's a nice excuse to me to get down into technologies uh, by packaging them. And I mainly focus on, uh, on clustering rela related stuff, uh, distributed databases, and um, and various Python-related packaging. So, Scylla. Raise your hand if you ever heard about it. OK, not that much. Who knows about Cassandra? OK, a lot more. Um, who likes garbage collection in Java? Nobody. All right. Well, Scylla is basically a, re a rewrite of Cassandra uh, in C++. So adios garbage collection and welcome fine tuning and fine, uh, fine grain hardware uh, uh, enhancements and performance enhancements. So it's fully compatible with Cassandra. As a matter of fact, you interact with SilaDB uh, using the Cassandra drivers. Um, so the promise is like you shut down your Cassandra uh, uh, server on your machine and you just fire up Scylla on the same machine and it just works. Uh, it has great code quality. So this is why the packaging side in Gentoo Linux uh, gets me a look at actually uh, some code. Um, it has a really low level uh, and modern approach on, on, uh, on performance tuning and auto tuning. Uh, the, the, the guys behind Scylla, Scylla is, um, are uh, the people that made KVM. So it's a, a kernel based virtualization. So they know a bit of uh, how to interact and make sure and to, to leverage the, the, the capacity of, uh, of your hardware and to interact with the, with the kernel. Uh, at a fairly good level, let's say. Um, when I approach a new technology, I, 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 I'm really careful and I really care about the people behind it. Uh, so uh, when I approach uh, upstream, when you are a packager, the, the, the people uh, making the technologies that you, you are trying to package, uh, you call them upstream. Uh, when you approach them the way that they welcome you or not, or that they welcome your ideas or yeah, your Criticism sometimes uh, tells a lot about uh, who they are and how open-minded their open source software is. It's not about only having an open source license on, on, your, on your GitHub, uh, which uh, obviously looks to be MIT, the, the, the right thing. Um, it's really about um, who they are and what do they stand for. So are they welcoming people? Are they benevolent in their interaction? So the code relies on system libs uh, uh, quite uh, quite a lot. So it's all, it fits well with the Gen2 QA uh, and, and code quality philosophy. So it's pretty easy to it was pretty easy to package. Uh, so it tells it tells a good good things about it. So it's a journey that I'm going to talk about uh, with real concrete use cases, and we'll we'll get down we'll get down to it. But I am applying a sort of methodology that is my own or our own, um, and I think it's important to, to just take a bit of time to explain it. So as I said, my first thing is to take the packaging side as an excuse to um, dive into the source code, interact with upstream, and then starting to contribute to, to the projects. 
so then you know their process and you, you start having a, a, a good feeling about how it's done. Then the second step will be an evaluation. Okay, we, you don't put this kind of new technology in production without evaluating it. So we are going to get down into how uh, we set up a POC, a proof of concept, and what we the methodology, the methodology that uh, that we applied in it, uh, into making sure that it was production ready for us. So for this, you need to find an actual use case, a real use case uh, that uh, will be able to, 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 to answer your real needs. Then you need to, be, to challenge a bit your, your own knowledge of the technology. Uh, I knew about Cassandra, I knew some basic stuff about Cassandra, and, uh, and, but it's not enough. You have to get a bit better at the internals. Uh, you set up a POC and then in this case you, you, we worked with, together with uh, Scylla DB Falls. Actually, in my, in, in my experience, it's the first time that I interacted with uh, some upstream that um, welcomed the POC and that actually contributed in the POC. So they made themselves available for the POC. The idea is we, are, we want to make sure that you have an unbiased uh, opinion on the technology and we want to make sure that it's not because you lack some knowledge and you took wrong decisions that you will take uh, uh, the wrong conclusion. So they offer their help, they will make themselves available and they will set up a, a private Slack channel, they will help you in schema design, you will get uh, fast answers, they will explain you the internals and then they will help in hardware sizing, all the things. And it's a really simple tech-to-tech -tech, uh, relationship. Uh, so it was. I was really impressed, and to my knowledge, they are the only ones uh, in the database world that have this set up uh, from, from the start. So it's pretty cool. You, know, you can just go to them and, and explain to them your, your, your problem and what you are trying to do, and they will be there to help you. And you can set up something a bit, uh, a bit more concrete. Um, so it's a really, un it's, it's no bullshit, right? You, you just talk to them. Um, the lessons I've got from this is you, you really have to have some kind of background. So I really recommend if you, you've never read it, uh, the O'Reilly book about on, on, on the definitive book on Cassandra. It's really good. It's not only about Cassandra itself. It's a, re, a bit about how distributed databases work, and, and it's um, it's a, it's a good reference book. So with this, you will have some basic understanding of how it's supposed to work. Um, in our case, we shared, uh, since we set up, let's say, an official POC with, uh, with CILADB, we set up a shared reference document. So it's something that, it's, a, it's really a, a document. In our case, it was a, a Google Doc, where we put on things like uh, who, are, who is going to participate, and then what is the hardware uh, that we are going to use, and then be we, we were very detailed about the use cases. So we explained, okay, today we do this using this kind of hardware, the number of hardware specifications, the schema that we were using, everything, all the details, every kind of detail you can give, you put them on a reference document. And then when you iterate and you go along with the POC, then you will keep on, every time you come to a conclusion, let's say, you will put it on the reference document. So it will help you as well to, to see what all, all the things, and then you can have notes, etc. So it, it's really important if you wanted to do a POC like this uh, with them, or with anyone, usually, I think. It's a, it's a nice, lesson, <coughs> nice lesson, I think, uh, to have really a shared ref and detailed reference document. Make sure. We, we made sure as well to have some solid monitoring because everything you do in this case when you monitor latency and we, you, you will understand why it's very critical, having a good relationship is, uh, monitoring is important. Um, know when to stop. It's really easy to go uh, into a POC and start and digress on things and digress on things and you want to refine and refine and refine. So make sure you know where your boundaries are and when to say, okay, it's good enough. Know when to stop. A POC has to end at some point, so make sure you, plan, you, you know where to end uh, from the start. Then it's a distributed database. 
Um, so of course it's not for everyone's needs. You, you don't go into this world if you have, uh, if, if MySQL can do the job, uh, obviously. So make sure you test high availability because this is a distributed system. Um, and test it very thoroughly. Remember that the POC is obviously not a production uh, system, uh, which will come with this uh, share of, uh, of surprises. So I will get back to it, but the conclusion shouldn't be like only the metrics. So uh, let's say, okay, it's faster, so it's enough. You know, in the production and all the, all the aspects that you will learn um, is, is important. And um, the lessons I got to see is make time. Uh, this POC, it's, it was pretty thorough, but it, 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 I, I worked on it for five months, over, the, over five months, let's say. But so this was not a full-time job, and I, some points uh, I was not very good at, uh, at always being, be, being there. So make sure you, you, you make time if you, if you want to, to try something like this. I, uh, I, I, okay. Business context. Who are we and why did we do this? So how are we going to and why are we going to evaluate Scylla? We work in the marketing industry. We are a MarTech company, so it's a contraction between marketing and technology. Um, so it's basically doing marketing, um, doing better marketing uh, with technology. So using the technology and data to do better marketing. Um, so it's a bit the contrary of spamming, right? Uh, so we deal with multiple sources of data and a wide range of events. Um, we, we, we see data as events. So we, any kind of data that comes or is updated this is a new event. It's a new knowledge that you have of the data. So you can see it as a continuously evolving. Uh, but the thing is, we have multiple sources of them. That means that when you have multiple sources of them, you need to be able to mix them and to correlate them at a massive, of, a, a massive amount. And it's a different type of events. One can be a purchase, while another can be a, 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 a web navigation. And we'll get back to this. And all of them have their own identifier. You can think it as primary keys, right? If you have different sources of data, you would store them with a primary key so you could query them. But since they are separate, they all have a different primary key. So how do you mix them? How do you correlate them? This is the key of, uh, of, uh, of people-based marketing. We, usually, we do this a lot. It's really important for us. Typical example, web navigation. You all have a cookie ID. CRM databases, do, uh, so CRM is, is the, is, are the ones that um, they are client database, okay? So are you, you are registered, yes, you've been client for how long, uh, you subscribe to this, you subscribe to that, and your uh, purchase history is this, etc. So it's everything a brand or a company knows about you. So CRM stands for Customer Relationship Management. So it's really how they, what they know about you that can help them talk to you personally better, so you have a better experience. Um, so usually on this, the email address is the ID, is the pr primary key, let's say. Uh, then we have partners digital platforms. So when you want to, I don't know, buy an ad on Google or on AppNexus or on something so it is displayed, you rely on another platform, which all uh, work with their own ID. So every one of us is known on the CRM database maybe has an email address. We have a cookie ID which has nothing to do with our email address on the web. And this cookie ID is different from uh, Google, from Apple, uh, from Facebook, and from uh, uh, us as well. But if you get all the signals and all the sources, how do you mix them together? to know something and to reduce, let's say, the pressure. Because it's people-based marketing, so we, we address people, we address us. So the idea is not to hammer people with a lot of, uh, as much as possible. It's about being uh, precise and, 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 and insightful. 
And of course, you have the mobile uh, mobile types. Uh, so in this case, it can be IDFA for 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 um, it's the name of uh, of the, the the ID for for Apple and uh, and GID for Google. So if we look at them again. You have systems to synchronize and translate identifiers to one another in your old, on all your data sources and, and, and types. If you want to be able to do this, you need what we will call ID matching tables. It's something that it's a table that has an ID and a corresponding ID for another platform. Okay, so maybe you have a cookie ID uh, from. Uh, uh, your platforms, and then you have the corresponding cookie ID. Okay, this user I know has a ABC, and he is one, two, three at Google. You need those translate. You need those tables to be able to translate one source of data, and to be able to, let's say, use it on your partner's platform, so that he knows who you are talking about. We'll get a, a concrete example just after this. The principle is, it relies on joins. So joins, you know, it's a heavy duty operation on databases, usually. So the key idea is you have a reference population in, in, in red here. You select it, and then you will join it using an ID matching table, and then you will get a match population. So on this match population, you will have the corresponding uh, target, let's say, uh, ID. So you do this all the time, as events flow in, all the time. And then you also update it all the time. That means this is a high read and also high write workload. So they are very, very um, important to keep in mind. It's read and write workloads because it's queried and updated all the time, those ID matching tables. Let's take an example, a recent example yeah, for Wikimedia. You know, and I, I'm not sure their fundraising is done already, but the recent, we, we, maybe you received emails or solicitations from Wikimedia Foundation uh, for, uh, for, um, for, uh, for their fundraising. So this example, we, in the marketing term, is retargeting. So it means that you have someone and you want to use another medium to, to speak to him. So we could have, the, from the Wikimedia Foundation, we have, let's say, a database with the previous donors, so the ones that donated something previously on the, on the, on the last uh, fundraising, and those ones you know by their email address. And you want to retarget them using an ad via Google Ads, let's say. So you will need to talk to the ad exchange of uh, Google, um, which works with cookie IDs. So your problem is how do I translate an email address to a cookie ID? Fine. You did an ID matching table for this. So you select the previous donors, you match them using the ID matching table, and then you can activate, it's a marketing term, you can activate them on a remote platform, let's say Google in this time. So when the user with ID 123, in the, if uh, generous at coconut.fr was uh, cookie ID 123 at Google, you could know it and then you could say it to Google, I want to create a campaign that will buy an ad for Wikimedia. You will, show, you will display this, uh, this ad with, so they can type in an amount and make the donation. And you will target Mr. 123 or Mrs. 123. And he knows who it is. So when user ID 123 browse the web anywhere and Google is there, they can display the ad because they know who he is. Make sense? This is how it works, basically. So those ID matching tables, they are the keystone of everything you can do, right? This is very, very, very important for us. How do we do it today? Today we have a typical Lambda architecture. We have events coming in, and they are split into two pipelines, a real-time pipeline and a batch pipeline. On the real-time one, we use MongoDB as a storage engine. So we have a message queue that comes, you have workers, they take the, the things, and then they store those matching IDs in, in MongoDB. 
And then we have real-time programs that interact with the, these events and say, OK, uh, I, I see this, and I know the matching is that, so I can do that. Whatever it is that you want to do, you know, you activate, upload this, remove someone because now he has done the donation. So stop adding, so stop buying ads for him, stop hammering it because we, we know now that he has done the donation. It's cool. Or change the ad and say and put an ad. Thank you. Well, if if uh, Wikimedia Foundation had the money for this, they could do it as well. But you see what I mean. So it's how you handle pressure. This is the essence of the technology behind the marketing. It's handling pressure and be potent in what you say to people. So this, is, this can be done in real time for certain use cases, but some others, they need some heavy duty computation and they need some other joints that, have, that are bigger. So the same kind of events, they are stored uh, um, on HDFS, though, so Hive is a, is a Hadoop ecosystem uh, database. So HDFS is the Hadoop file system. Distributed file system, sorry. So we put them on, on and then they, they get integrated into Hive tables, and then we can do batch calculation and target and, or do something. So it's two different pipelines, basically. What's not good with it? Well, that means that we have to store, first, we have to store the same data twice. And we have to handle all the burden and all the problems that come with it keeping data in sync, making sure it's consistent. How do you make the freshness in the batch data as good as possible? It's an operational burden. You have to operate two, kind of, two kinds of databases, and everything is uh, behind, behind it. We do it because neither Mongo nor Hive can sustain the read and write throughput and workload that comes with the either real-time programs, which are sensible to latency, and batch calculation, which are <laughs> sensible to mass and parallel reads. So none of them can sustain both. The ideal implementation would, would look like this. What if we could have one database, one copy, one truth of the data that can sustain both real-time and uh, batch workloads. It would be simpler to have data consistency. Um, it would give us some operational simplicity and efficiency, obviously, and it will also reduce costs because of all this. So the question was simple. Can Scylla do it? When I came into Scylla and I saw, okay, it's uh, it's a, it's, it's a rewrite of Cassandra. Cassandra is known and famous for his uh, write throughput uh, uh, property, let's say. And since it uses the hardware well, the, the claim, the claim is, or the promise is, we can also have consistent and low latency reads. Okay. So maybe the bet is this. Can I put Scylla there? This is the bet. High write throughput, fast reads, low latency for both. This is what I advertise. So when you do a POC, depending, but I took some <laughs> recycled machines. I said, OK, let's, let's test this new hardware with the best omens possible. What are the worst, no, not the worst, but uh, what are the best from my worst uh, machines that are sitting around in the cave? And I found those. Uh, so yes, that's it. indeed 19 gigs of RAM. It's un pretty unusual. They are not even consistent in the number of cores. They will run Gen2 Linux. Um, the idea is, if the software is so good and the hardware not that much, if I can get some competing results with this kind of hardware using Scylla, then I can fairly bet that on my production system with real hardware, I will be able to, 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 to find something very good. So I went into this. And then we, were, we are going to go in the steps that I followed in this, uh, in this uh, POC. So the first thing was, I need to validate the schema model first. 
because it has nothing, uh, Cassandra and, and, and has nothing to do with Hive and, and Mongo. So I need to find a way to, to, to model the, 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 the data that I need. When you do Cassandra, and if you know Mongo, it's the same reasoning behind, so it's, it was pretty, pretty easy uh, for, for me that uh, I've been using, and we've been using Mongo uh, en masse for, for more than 10 years now, uh, so, or something like this, eight years five, easily. So query-based modeling is part of us. Maybe it's not part of you, so that's something you have to, to, to adapt. But it's basically you define your schema, not from your purely on your data or the relation, let's say, that it has, but on all the questions that you want your data to answer or your model to answer. So you list them. Maybe you take the first one. What are all the cookies associated, cookie IDs associated to the given partner ID? So give me a partner ID, I will give you all the cookie ID that I know. And you can get a bit trickier over the last n months. So now you had a time window, something like this, in this. And the reverse is true as well. So if I give you a cookie ID, can you give me a, a, a partner ID, for example? <coughs> this is the simplest, obviously. There is a term in this that is uh, really potent in the NoSQL database world, let's say, is denormalization. Denormalization means that it's OK to keep the same data fully or not, but usually fully, but store it in a different way. So when you have a question, you can have your model optimized for this question, and if you wanted to answer the contrary question, that's okay that you can keep a copy, but you reverse, let's say, the primary key. This is called denormalization. And this is heavily used in Cassandra, and this is heavily okay. So it's not natural for us, because we are trained, let's say, and, and, and taught uh, at school to model things with relational and okay, and uh, put everything in the same thing and it will go fine. Distributed database and this kind of, of modeling, no. Denormalization is almost the norm. So be prepared as well for it if you, if you, if you, if you want to go that, that way. So in our case, we, we ended up with three copies of the data to answer all the, all the, of the same data. But it's on the same engine, and you have a way to consistently write all of them together at the same time or not. Okay, the batch, there is a notion of batching, etc., that allows you to have a consistent data in all the copies or diversions that you can have of this data. So this is done. So it's not like having Two, day, two copies of the same data in different engines that we had before. In this case, it's totally okay. Of course, I prototyped it using uh, Python and the Cassandra driver then. Um, for this, I used a, a, a test-driven data modeling. It's basically you, you, you know your reference data set and you know what kind of output you expect and you write with PyTest, I use PyTest, you, you, you write um, that uh, validates the output from the, an input. So all your iteration, you just have to rerun the test and you make sure that everything's still working fine. It helped me a lot. I know maybe you are not all used to use Cassandra, etc., but on, on this presentation, I will sometimes also go back into some tips, so internal tips that I got along the way. So maybe it can help you later as far as the reference or right now if you are already using Cassandra. But, um, but I found them interesting and I, 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 I will share them with you. One of the first uh, tips I got is on the schema and on the clustering order. You see on line seven, the clustering order on, on Cassandra and on Scylla then uh, defines how data is sorted when it's stored on disk. So when it's it's represented on, on, on disk. They are called SS tables. This is the name of the files. This is their own making, let's say. The way it's sorted depends on the clustering order. By default, it's ascending, meaning that the latest value is at the end of the file. So everything, everything you write and is written is written at the end. OK, and stored at the end. That means that when you query it, 
depending on how you plan to query it, it can have an impact on latency when you have to go to disk. In our case, we are mostly, not always, but mostly uh, interested in recent data. That means that we can have questions as, what is the latest cookie ID given for the partner ID? So actually, the clustering order will have an impact on where it is stored. If it's stored at the end, and you look for this kind of query, it will get on the right SS table if it's not in cache, and it will have to get down into the file until it finds the answer for you. But it has to scan the file. If you revert this and you just change, in this case, the date ordering to descending, that means that your latest value is at the top of the SS table of the file. So then when you look, and it's not in cache, and then you look at, the, at what is the latest value for this cookie, you get it faster because it doesn't have to scan the file. It just gets the first element it has and it's done. So it's internal trips, right? It's, it's really a bit uh, deep level trick, but this is the kind of trick that can have a real impact on latency and things like that. So when a lot of your business like us relies on this, it has a significant impact. And this is the kind of learning that you can get also, uh, that I got, by interacting with the guy, with the CLADB guys. So it's pretty valuable. The second one was to set, was to set up Scylla uh, Grafana monitoring. So this is the n actual name of a project that Scylla is giving. It's Docker-based, it's easy to install, it supports multi-environment. It's, it's really great. Uh, you can use the standard Cassandra test on, the, on your Scylla cluster uh, tool to test it, so you can see curves, things, and you can start grasping a bit the dashboard and understanding under the hood. But since you will be iterating and trying things, it's important that you have a proper monitoring to, to, to check it out. Um, so key graphs, uh, quickly, number of open connections. This one, if your driver doesn't open co uh, a lot of connection, that means that maybe it's not uh, doing any uh, enough parallelism, uh, cache hit meets, etc. Whatever you, you get used to it, and, and we, we got used to it, and it helped a lot uh, from the start. A, a little, a little tip I got on, on on this one was to reduce the scrape interval. It, it uses Prometheus, so basically it's the number of points that you will get. Since on the POC your workloads will be short in time because you want to iterate fast. Having a, a smaller than default um, scrape interval allows you to have uh, more data in your, in your graphs faster. So it was pretty, pretty, pretty good as well to be to have the graph more reactive to your to your short tests. Then you you the the next thing we did is prepare prepare a reference data and metrics. So we. We took a reference population of, let's say, 10 million people, and we had a 400 million ID matching table. So do, those were, were fixed and were used in all, all the cases that uh, we, will, we will see uh, after. But this is our reference data set. And it's important, it, it's important when you do this kind of thing to, 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 to have a reference data set. We decided to measure on our current stack, so here again, it depends on, uh, on, on, on people, but um, we wanted real metrics on our current stack. So that's uh, how we did it. So that means that we run the things and with this data set on our production systems first to have reference metrics. So we use Spark and Hive, since the data is in Hive on, on for this kind of workload. So you can see that you have your reference, we, we have our reference data set in Hive, we use Spark. Who doesn't know about Spark? Okay, Spark is a distributed framework um, to do to do computation. Okay, it's heavily used on data engineering and data science. So basically, it allows you to take some. The the, the, the schema is explains this well. I hope um, you take a reference data set that is, let's say, too large to be comp computed on a single machine. So it will partition it efficiently, and that you can apply any kind of computation. So it spreads workers 
that, calls, that are called executors, and each of the executors do a little part of it, and then it merges the results back for you in an efficient way. It's, it's written in Scala. And it's very, very popular and very good. Very, 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 very good. So this is exactly what we did. We had our reference population in a Hive table, our uh, ID matching table in another, uh, and we took the uh, 10 million that got split by Spark into main, in, in little partitions. On each partition, we do the join, and then we merge this and we count. Fine? OK. Reference results on an idle cluster. So this, this cluster is, uh, is, um, is about 80 machines. That means that you have more than 80 machines uh, and, and, and quite a, a, few, a few thousand workers possible in parallel. When the cluster is mostly idle, it takes two minutes and 15 seconds. On a normal loaded cluster, that means with available workers when you request them, you can do it in four minutes. When it's overloaded, meaning that you submit the job, but there is no available worker, so Spark has to wait to have let's say, a slot, a worker slot, and then it can start working. It, took, uh, 15, it takes 15 minutes. Of course, you run it multiple times, and then you get the median. But basically, it's just to have an ID. Okay? This POC and the way I got into this is not about benchmarking. It is not a benchmark. It is a real use case. So it's a real comparison for a, for a real use case. And then you start test, uh, testing using uh, Scylla. Uh, on Scylla, you have two things to consider, is the hot and cold cache scenarios. Scylla has a mechanism of cache. So if you do a query the first time you are in the cold cache scenario, it has to go to disk, basically. So it's mostly disk IO bound. And when you do the same query again, and the cluster has not restarted, you are in the hot cache scenario. So it is usually, but not always, depending on your RAM, in RAM, and then you have the answer faster. So this one is more memory bound. The idea here is to try to break Scylla. So how can I put enough pressure with my current cluster or my, my tests so that Scylla is like at 90% or almost 100% usage? Where this is where the monitoring helps. So you can see actually how, how far you push Scylla. If you don't get Scylla that far, that means that it's not Scylla the problem, it's your, your, your client side, right? So you, don't, you are not pushing enough uh, pressure. So it looks like this. Uh, we will be using Spark. Here we have the, the reference data set in high, but now the ID matching table sits in Scylla. And you split. The hive spark will split the hive in partitions, like, just like usual, and then instead query Scylla to do the to do the ID matching and then do the count. So I put a bit of code. Uh, it, it, it's just a, as, as an example, but uh, the the Spark Cassandra connector has this join with Cassandra table that allows you to join, to do the actual join uh, in an efficient way. Uh, that means that he knows where the data is stored on, on Cassandra and then on Scylla. It's the same implementation again. So it can be clever about it, and this is how, how it's done. Here I give you some, some insight. If you use Spark and you want to use it uh, with uh, either Cassandra or Scylla, uh, I, I use the fixed number of exec executors. This, is, uh, this was pretty important. Maybe it's obvious, but uh, uh, so I used 30 executors max and that were al always provisioned for this, this use case so that when I try again and try again, I don't uh, have uh, results uh, when uh, 200 of them were running while another case uh, only four of them were running. So if you, have, if you want to have consistency in your tests, you have to fix the number of executors. By, by default, it's a dynamic allocation. The, sp uh, the Spark split size is really important. You have to match the, the Spark split size is eight. So eight megabytes, loose partitions like we, we saw. By default, it's eight megabytes. But when you put pressure on, on, on Scylla and Cassandra, they expect one megabyte. So by tuning this, you are actually aligning Cassandra split partition with uh, Scylla's. And then you, you have a huge performance boost. Then it's about adjusting driver timeouts. And, and uh, the reads per second were actually uh, this one you have to tune yourself. So 
I incremented it and saw the load going up and up and up. So this, this was the best for the 90% uh, I, I was seeking. But uh, if you wanted to do it, you, you would get a, a, another one. Um, failure, retry, the number of connections for the executors, this one has a huge impact on, 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 um, on, um, on the pressure you put on Scylla. Um, when I did this, there were almost no reference documentation. Since then, they, they worked pretty hard on, uh, on, 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 on blog posts and, and webinars. So I put on some links if you're interested in how you, you interact. It's, uh, it's pretty good. OK, the results. So with these three recycled hardwares, Reference result, 2 minutes, 15 seconds, normal for f 4 minutes, overloaded 15. In this case, cold cache scenario, I could do the same in, twen in 12 minutes. And in hot cache scenarios, 2 minutes. I was like, wow. Three recycled machines, they really can compete <laughs> with actual, my actual hive production cluster. I mean, it's comparable already. With the, tu with the tuning I, I explained before, of course, uh, without the tuning, no way. But with the tuning, or the, the right the tuning, I can do it easily. So the three machines, they, they, re they already compete with the, the, the 30 executors, or the 30 machines, and all the machines behind Hive. With spinning disks, uh, I don't remember if you remember, but uh, they are spinning disks. Okay. Pretty interesting, uh, even 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 against an idle cluster, it's, it's pretty interesting. Now I digress. I had to. I mean, Spark is great, but my interaction with Spark and I, I had to find a way because there is the real-time pipeline, and this real-time pipeline is not on Hadoop and is mostly and only written in Python. So I had to find. I, I couldn't live with myself without trying with Python as well. The problem is you can do it with PySpark, for example, uh, which allows you to use Spark uh, from Python, but there is no join with Cassandra table uh, method. Okay, so I said, okay, maybe, <laughs> maybe I don't need Spark 2 at all. Maybe, and the reasoning behind it is, okay, but Spark 2 is, is clever because it can do the join and he has a, a clever function to do it. But maybe I can do 10 million single lookups in parallel enough using Python in a relative uh, comparable time than Spark. You can't beat Spark, I, I mean, you can't beat Spark from a single machine. It, it, it runs on multiple machines, but what you can beat, let's say, the, the, the flexibility that you have is Spark is Scala and runs on the JVM, and on the Hadoop ecosystem, all those workers are containers that are scheduled by a scheduler that is called Yarn. So when you submit a Spark job, it goes through a scheduler that gets all the available resources that schedule the run of an executor in one of those servers that he has available, that loads up the JVM, and then that starts working. This takes time. All the scheduling and loading up the JVM takes time. This is where maybe I said, I said to myself, well, Python, I don't have all this firing up uh, latency. So maybe I can compete a bit with, uh, with Spark uh, doing this, even if that means that I have to distribute 10 million requests <laughs> instead of doing a join uh, using a in simple function. So, okay, I said, I'm going to try. Uh, challenge accepted. Let's go. Maybe, 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 maybe I, I will go. If I break it down, I just need to leave the 10 million rows. For every row, look up the corresponding uh, matching table, and then do the count. Okay, that's where I met Dask. Dask is a distributed computation framework written in Python, so you can compare it with great care with Spark. But the idea is basically the same. 
So you have to load the data in a partition way and run the lookups from all the, 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 the machines that you have available. So in my case, I ran 30, since I had 30 executors, I ran 30 Dask workers and then merge the results and Dask will do that for you. So it looks like this. So it's pretty similar to what we, we did in Spark, but we do it in Dask. Cool. The results, wow. Cold cache, six minutes. Hot cache, two minutes. So in the cold cache scenario, I could outperform Spark. It's interesting. Mostly the why is due to the latency that uh, I don't have. That means that I could start querying faster instead of hammering in one, in one, in one time, let's say, uh, uh, using Spark. So it's, it's pretty good. And the way that the Python driver does this as well is pretty efficient. So, it's, uh, so it already worked. And then I got curious and I got into it and I said, what, things, what are those two minutes made of? And actually, I saw that it was made of for 50 seconds from, for DAS to load the data from Hive, which is also a distributed database. And Hive is slow when you query. That's why you can't use it in the real-time pipeline in the first place. When you submit a query to Hive, it already takes 15 seconds to get initialized. That means that I could maybe, if I get rid of Hive, I can be faster than Spark. That's what I did. I switched from Hive to Parquet Files. So Parquet is a file storage format, columnar oriented, uh, that allows you to put your files as uh, cold, cold files and your data in cold files, let's say, that you can load up as data frames uh, for those that are used to it. And then you can query them pretty easily. It's just a way to store data efficiently on disk in the cold way, okay? So there is no engine in between. You just load them and you you look at them on, with libraries. Here, the game changer was libhdfs3 that allows Dask to get to the file in HDFS, and then PyArrow to read the parquet file in a effi memory efficient way. This, the, this combo was magic, really magic. I started with other libs, and those ones I get like 10 times faster with those ones. Very, very good. And when I did this, the cold cache scenario was a bit better. But, st but it's the odd cache scenario. I, I, I managed to cut down that almost two. So it'd be twice, fast, f twice faster as, a, as, a, as the Spark 2 uh, scenario. And then I was really, really amazed. I was like, wow, those three machines, I can do this in one minute, five seconds. So, that's so the Dask results, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's this cold cache, hot cache, one minute, five seconds, when you compare it to Spark 2 results and uh, the reference results, more, moreover, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting for recycled machines, right? I got some tips out of uh, Dask with Sparket. Um, execute concurrent is, a, it, it, so in Python, uh, it's, a, it's a Python uh, uh, function. I, I put on a little example, Python code, on how it's done, the loading, because it, it took me a while to, to get this right, to be honest. And this is the very efficient way to do it. I could load the data in less than 10 seconds, no, the 10 million data in less than 10 seconds, so it's pretty impressive. Uh, using libEV as well as a connection class instead of the default async core adds uh, uh, concurrency uh, in the Cassandra Python driver, and it, it, it had a good impact on, 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 on performance. Then I played with high availability. Then here I got disappointed by the Cassandra driver, to be honest, because, for example, all the exceptions are not in the same namespace. So you have to be very thorough in your testing to simulate all the kind of errors and distinguish the client-side errors that are from the server-side errors and find out which and from where the kind of exception it will raise. Uh, it, was, well, it, it, it was a bit of a mess. So here I put on the names of the all the main ones that I found. Uh, and then you have to play with the policies on, on, and the consistency level that, uh, that, that you use uh, for, for this. So this is meant for really for, for the consistency of the data uh, when, when, you, when you, you address the cluster. So 
of course, if I'm here to, <laughs> before you today, I, I, I really found in, uh, fell in love with, uh, with, with Scylla. Um, I want to stress out again that, and we decided to go for it uh, in, uh, in production, but the decision itself is not, and since it was not a benchmark, the decision itself doesn't come from just the one minute, five seconds that I got and the two minutes that, okay, is, is better than uh, the, the Hive cluster that I have uh, today. It, it's, it's, not the real, it's not the real point. Um, data consistency is one of the, of the drivers, obviously, because now I have all in the same place. So my data is consistent, even if it's denormalized, it's fine. Um, I get production reliability as well um, by, uh, by not having two kinds of, uh, of things. And it's um, Scylla, just like Cassandra, is data center aware. So in our case, where we have multiple data centers, we can have multiple copies of the data. And it's, it has a, a great deal of uh, uh, local uh, latency and global consistency and availability, of course. Uh, it's pretty easy to operate, to be honest. So the auto-tuning, et cetera, is, and the, the, the provided Scylla setup uh, tools uh, basically do everything for you for the tuning of the system. So it's pretty cool. Uh, it helped rationalize the infrastructure, meaning the maintenance. Um, it's, um, it's pretty developer friendly but it's not MongoDB, okay? And it's not meant to. So MongoDB is really developer friendly. Anyone can fire it up easily and start playing. And it's very permissive. The way it's designed is very permissive. Cassandra and then and the Scylla are not permissive. The, the modeling is not really permissive. It's really only performance oriented. So that's why you denormalize and you specialize your data. So in, in one way, it's not that developer friendly. And of course, it reduces costs uh, because I don't have to, 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 to struggle with the whole operations of, of, of this consistency in between the things. Production environment. We, took, we started with three, three Dell machines, uh, quite a lot of RAM per machine, okay? 512 uh, gigs of RAM per machine, of course. RAM is, a, is, is really important in, in databases. Um, we use NVMe disks, so the Scylla guys, they can definitely, and they, they publish uh, a lot of benchmarks this time on, uh, on uh, NVMe or different kinds of disks. So make sure you, you pick the right ones. They have a huge impact on latency. They run on Gen2 Linux, of course. They are, this is a DC aware setup, so well, next step is to scale it onto another data center, and it will be done really easily. We use Ansible to provision our infrastructure as code, uh, so everything is deployed using uh, Ansible and configured uh, using Ansible. That includes user role management. Uh, it's, of course, monitored by the graph and monitoring, and all the housekeeping, all the, the things that you have to do to to clean or keep your data, data clean is handled by, uh, by the provided uh, Scylla manager. So it's running live now. So everything I showed you is running uh, for real. And uh, this, is, uh, this was me trying to share how we got, it, we got there and, uh, and, and all the things that we learned along the way. Thank you very much. So the question is, you do all your modeling uh, by, by having, let's say, business side questions or usage side questions. And what happens when a new question pops up so over after the time, several after, after several days? It's very, the schema is very flexible. You can change it on the fly, add columns, and change it on the fly. So if your schema allows, by adding a new field, for instance, to answer the new question, then it's fine. You just do it. It has zero cost. It's easy, really easy to, to, to add or to change the schema. It's, it's, it's really easy 
and uh, it's not a big big deal for this kind of database. If not, you denormalize again. And how I get all that? Like? That's your job. Ah, okay. Of course, yeah. You, so yeah, you you have you. There are ways. There are other ways, like materialized view that can. But uh, it, it, we can talk to it about if you want in details. But uh, yeah, you, the backfilling is up to you. Thanks. Thank you.